Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and I'm here with Meher Roy. Today, we're speaking with Zach Williamson and Joe Andrews, who are the founders of AdTech and CEO and company president, respectively. Zach and Joe, you have been on the show before, um, twice actually, in your case, Zach. Can you briefly remind us what's, what, what AdTech actually does and how the vision of the project has changed since inception? So yeah, hi, hi everyone, and um, thanks, thanks for having us on. So, Aztec has, has changed changed a lot over the years. Um, but, um, also since we last spoke, I think. Uh, so it's been about it's almost six years since we got started in this space, and Aztec has always been a privacy focused company. So building um, privacy preserving infrastructure for Web three. However, the um, the way in which we go about this has changed radically over the years as as the technology. Um, uh, that we can work with has improved. And so our main focus now, which I think Joe can speak more about, is building a, a fully programmable, privacy-preserving um, smart contract layer, effectively an end-to-end -end, uh, encrypted blockchain. Yeah, thanks for having us on. I, I can fill in some more, more details. I, I guess like to speak to, to what Zach was hinting at, Like over the years we've tried to build products with what was currently the cutting edge of cryptography. And a lot of that's been pushed by kind of our internal research done by Zach and our kind of cryptography team. Um, but the goal has always been to kind of build a kind of programmable private version of Ethereum. We just didn't have the, the technology to to actually do it kind of at various points over the years. So we had to settle for, uh, I guess, sli slightly less functional versions of the technology. Uh, and, and some of those people will be familiar with. So we had kind of Aztec 2, Uh, which is the first time we had ZK Money, which did just basic Zcash style private payments. Um, and then we spent about a year upgrading that to add Aztec Connect functionality uh, in the form of kind of private DeFi mediated on, on L1. Um, and all of that was really kind of trying to push out technology with um, the best of ZK Snarks uh, in 2021 and 2022. Um, but it wasn't really kind of the end goal. It was kind of showing The, the state of the technology at that time. Um, and yeah, we're thrilled kind of over the, the recent months that we've been able to kind of actually work on our, our end vision, which is uh, abstracting those roll-ups into a fully generic version that uh, other developers can deploy programs to. Uh, and that's what we call Aztec 3. Uh, we've shortened now to just Aztec, kind of the, the realization of our kind of uh, ultimate vision. So if you look at each of these stages, so basically the first time we had you on, um, you guys had just launched ZK Money. So basically, and you could you could deposit any ERC20 token into your L2 and, and you could transfer it within the L2 privately and you could withdraw it back to the L1. And then basically in Aztec 2, which is the second time we had you on, um, you had you had all of you know the, these private token transfer trans, transfers on L2, plus you had some DeFi integrations. So basically, you could send um, tokens from a shielded pool to some L1 DeFi contracts, um, and so basically the tokens they they were in fact reshielded. Um, so that kind of in a way gave some in some sense anonymity to DeFi users on L1. This was super useful, but as I understand it, Aztec 3 kind of radically expands on that vision. Can you give us an idea of what, when it launches? And I think we have to be very clear that basically this is, um, th this is still, there's not even a test net yet, right? So basically you want to launch this by the end of Soon. next year. <laughs> Soon. And that's it. Yeah. Um, we, we, we could talk about the, the roadmap in, in a second, but m maybe just to kind of highlight on the point about the, the functionality changes. So if you look at kind of uh, just the payments version of Aztec, that was one circuit uh, or one, one kind of contract, you can think of it, written by the Aztec team. Um, and it took kind of probably six, seven months for the team to write that and, and audit it and deploy it to make the, the basic ERC-20 um, L2 transfer uh, functionality. 
And then with kind of Aztec 2 and Aztec Connect, we we upgraded that to add in kind of a, a few more uh, contracts or circuits, um, an account circuit, and uh, which gave aliases and these DeFi circuits, which let you um, kind of send send uh, kind of tokens to L1, uh, as you described. Um, but those circuits kind of took a very long time for our team of cryptographers to to build and audit. And the reason for that is that they were all acting on on shared state. So it's not really something that uh, you can extend uh, very easily. So the main kind of breakthrough in functionality that Aztec 3 kind of affords is developers can now write their own circuits um, and they can have siloed state or in- interoperable state between different uh, contracts. Um, and kind of really generalizing what we were trying to do with with Aztec 2 and removing us from having to write the circuits. We'll write one uh, execution environment and then everyone else can deploy their own contracts and programs do that. And and that's kind of the, the premise behind Aztec. Uh, there's a lot to unpack here. And um, may- maybe I'll start with kind of the cracks of the matter that I don't understand um, yet. I hope I will understand it by the end of this episode. So there, you, you're talking about different kinds of state. And I think this is kind of what I want to understand. I want our listeners to understand by the end of this episode. So how do you actually um, have something without intermediaries um, where you can have different sets of state that are still consistent with one another? So maybe let's kind of start at the beginning. So. What I, our listeners will be familiar with, hopefully, um, is um, the ZK EVM, um, because we very recently had Jody and David on. Um, so the way that the ZK EVM um, works, it basically it takes every opcode um, on Ethereum and transpiles it into a corresponding ZK opcode. And this is very much what you're not doing. So kind of walk us through why, be, because in principle, um, that seems like such a good way of kind of making everything private, right? Basically, you just take what you already have and what you know the EVM can deal with, and you kind of build, a, you know, a ZK version of it. So w- why did you not chose to go down this route? And how, um, because your sounds way more complicated. Um, so yeah, just walk us through this. I can, I can, I can try and field that one. So the reason why we've gone down this route is because you cannot just wrap the Ethereum virtual machine in a ZK snark and make it private. And it's because of ha- um, the information that's revealed when you modify state. So a, like a blockchain at its core is a glorified state machine. Um, you have some, some database of um, information uh, and transactions come in that change the database and you have nodes that check that those transactions follow the rules of your blockchain. And the problem is that the that that database is public. Um, so even if you wrap the EVM in a zk snark and create zk opcodes, the actual information that's going into this, um, the like the, the database that makes up the state of your chain, that it doesn't like the like wrapping wrapping the the, the validation logic in a, in the snark doesn't make the information um, that's being transmitted private uh, by de- like it, like nothing nothing changes about it. Um, you could take you could go one step further and say, okay, well now let's let's encrypt the Ethereum database. Let's say that every single storage slot on Ethereum is in, in, encrypted with some encryption key that um, somebody has. Uh, even then, that's not that gives you very very weak privacy, no privacy at all really. Because uh, if you think about the um, Ethereum state database, right, it's, it's basically it's a big key value database where let's take for example your Ethereum account. You have an address that's linked to a balance. Let's say you can encrypt that address, and you can encrypt the balance, and you can still through the through zk snarks through zk opcodes, you can modify that that balance. That still leaks a lot of information because your if repeated if you make repeated transactions from that address, the same like on the same um, position in the database is going to have its not values changed. So even if your address is encrypted, your values are encrypted. Um, like you can see, there's encrypted values changing per transaction, and therefore you can build up the transaction graph and build up an, a, like an, a, an identity of of who a person is, 
this time not defined by their their Ethereum address, it's defined by their, their position in the Ethereum state tree that um, that their encrypted balance lies. Uh, so so functionally, it gives you very little just to to turn Ethereum into a zk snob. You need a, a bit of a more uh, a more involved model um, to actually get strong user privacy. And a big part of what we're doing is whilst the architecture is relatively complex, the abstractions that you can layer above it and like kind of the heuristics you can you can apply to use it. At least if we do our jobs right, those will be very simple. Well, I was going to add, add a few things. Like even if you could solve kind of the the act of kind of uh, updating encrypted state, and there's been a few papers where people are trying to solve this, um, you you still end up in a pretty weird world where you have race conditions. So let's say I want to pay Zach, um, and Frederick also wants to pay Zach. Well, we're both trying to modify the same piece of encrypted state. Um, so basically, you you can't have a, a system that uh, resolves that. Uh, on Ethereum, the the entity that resolves that is the block builder uh, who executes uh, the transactions. Um, so if we now give those transactions to a, a block builder to execute, then again, you have further privacy leaks. So um, yeah, you really can't get strong privacy um, in, in the account-based model. Um, so you have to have a very different uh, kind of model and, and data type to actually build a privacy chain. Um, and this is why we say kind of externally sometimes that the EVM is not privacy compatible. So that's why we, we don't build uh, a ZK EVM. Uh, we build a ZK VM, um, which can have kind of privacy preserving properties, which maybe Zach can talk a little bit about how that actually works. So um, from my perspective, like I think like restating what, what Zach has said, maybe we start off imagining, you know, the, the ledger or the state as being, you know, um, for simplicity, like rows, rows and columns with like each row indicating, let's say, an account to start with. And then the data that's there is kind of like balances data. And then there are transactions happening. Like if it's a normal blockchain, there's, there's transactions happening and a transaction is subtracting from one of the rows and it's adding to uh, another row. In this model, if you think of what a ZK EVM like Polygon is doing, the fundamental thing it's doing is when, let's say, I send a transaction and I subtract from row 2 and I add to row 17, then uh, it is the ZK EVM is in the end generating a proof that when you execute my transaction, the ledger uh, adds plus 10 to row 17 and minus 2 from me and that this is correct. So if, if there is another copy of the ledger with the updated balances, plus 10 and minus 10, the proof just tells you that uh, that new ledger is indeed correct. What it doesn't tackle is the problem of sort of hiding that uh, it is plus, plus 10 in the first place, right? Like ideally what we want to be hid is the fact that 10 was shifted and we also want to hide the fact that 10 was shifted from 2 to 17. The problem that a ZK EVM deals with is once you have the transaction and this was the consequence of the transaction, the consequence is correct. That is what a ZK EVM is, deals with. But it doesn't deal with the fact that how do, you con how do you conceal the 10 and how do you conceal rows 2 and rows 17. And that's kind of the problem that that you are starting to starting to solve. Yes, that's that's exactly it. That's that's a, that's a great explanation. Thank you for that. Uh, and yeah, that you have to, you have to break away from the EVM model to solve it. When initially we talked about your Aztec Cash or or the first version of your system, it it was already solving this problem of. If you have two and uh, rows two and rows seventeen, and there are the simple subtractions and simple additions, how do you kind of obfuscate all of that? Uh, but that this was all already achieved by Zcash in in some sense in um, in in prior history, and now um, now your jump is that if you imagine row number sixteen, that somehow that row number sixteen could represent an entire smart contract with its code and with a data set that is more complex than a 
than a simple balance. Is that a is that a good way of imagining it? Yeah, it's 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 good. Let me let me try and expand on that. So, what a smart contract in Elastic does is it um, it effectively it controls a set of rows in the in the database. Um, what rows they are is it is up to the contract. Um, depends how many storage slots you're using. Um, uh, but you, you'll have some contract that defines the, the, the rules and the logic around like which rows in the database can be modified, you can modify them, how they're encrypted. Uh, and then what will sort of what will happen is that a, a user will, when they submit a transaction, they will they will basically they will be submitting requests to to modify some encrypted state. So they'll say here's some here's some old encrypted values, here's some new encrypted values. This is a bit of a simplification, actually. I can explain why it doesn't actually work. Like some, but it's a simplification. So you can say, here is here's some old encrypted values. Here are some new encrypted values, and here is a zk proof that proves that I followed the rules of this of of the of the smart contract that controls these rows. Uh, and and um, therefore, you can, if you verify the proof, you can trust. Yep, okay, this is legit. I don't need to know what's inside these encrypted values. I can just the the the, the node can just update the state. Right. So, I mean, if so, if we if we kind of like imagine our huge Excel sheet, maybe it has like tens of thousands of rows. We can say that let's say like rows one thousand to rows two thousand, they are encrypted, right? Like you can you cannot make sense of any of it. And let's say like they belong to a to to a smart contract, which which maybe like a voting smart contract, for example, right? So rows 10, 1,000 to 2,000 belong to a voting smart contract. And then what you're essentially allowing me to do, so if I'm a voter in, in one of these elections, I am basically sending a transaction and it's going to make some changes to rows 1,000 to 2,000, some part of, of the state. But what comes in is kind of like 1000 or 2000 is kind of encrypted what comes out is also encrypted and but i am also so when i'm submitting a transaction i'm submitting a proof that despite the input being encrypted and the output being encrypted my uh, the transition is kind of correct and my vote was counted correctly and i did not interfere with the election process yes um, that's that's pretty much it. It's kind of hard to do. There's um, but I I can yeah we can we can talk through some of the some of the some of the details of how to how like how to make that happen if that would be of interest. Yeah, why why is it hard to do? Maybe on a high level. On a high level, there are, there are two problems, possibly three. One of them is that if you have an a, a, an encrypted database, if you have it, if you have a database that says that needs to be privacy preserving, you can't. Really, you ha you ha you have to use a, U a UTXO model for your state. So you can't use an account-based model uh, because it's not enough just to hide encrypt the information associated with a row. When a transaction modifies a, a row in that database, you also need to hide which row is being modified, uh, which is a little bit hard to do in an account-based model where you're basically every every state variable is is a, is a, it's a key and a value. Um, and you can encrypt the value, but the key describes like what like what information are you actually adding and, and changing to the in the database. You can't really encrypt that. To, to give an example of why uh, it's difficult to hide state changes in a private environment, let's consider the the the, to the basic token transfer case. Let's say I want to I want to I want to pay you Meha. I want to pay Joe. I want to pay um, Friedrich. Um, then what I will be doing is I will be deducting t tokens from my balance and adding them to your balances. Um, the problem is that in a, in a, if in an account based state model, even if my balance is encrypted, you can see three transactions coming in, changing the same balance. <laughs> so you know that, um, those transactions are affecting a person. You don't know it's me, but you know, it's somebody. Um, and you know that for every transaction and therefore you can start to build up a transaction graph of what entities are interacting with other entities, even if you don't actually know their addresses. And so if you want a private database, you need it to be um, append only. So, so if you have a smart contract that modifies, that can, that can control some private state, um, it doesn't so much control 
rows in a database as it has the ability to add new rows to this database, but it can't, can't change existing rows. It can only add. Um, and then you can, you can use the same tools that Zcash used to um, delete records in the database. So effectively, you, you, have a, you have a data structure where you can, you can add records, you can destroy records, but you can't change them. And so you have so to to emulate. Um, obviously, you, in the real world, you, you do want to change values. You know, um, if I want to, um, if you, I, I want to represent things like balances, but you have to emulate that um, by having some private state that represents a balance. If I then want to send a token to Joe, that balance gets destroyed, and a new balance that represents my balance gets recreated at a different row in the database. Um, that is one less than my old balance, and you can cons- you can craft um, your system such that. You cannot link the creation and destruction of of, of data, um, which sounds a little complicated, but it is essentially what how Bitcoin works with it, with its concept of unspent transaction objects. Except just that we extend that to instead of representing cryptocurrency values, it represents whatever a smart contract w- wants it to represent. I think I I understand this. So it's kind of it's it's a mashup between the UTXO and the account based model. Um, but what I'm wondering, isn't that terribly inefficient? Basically, that if every time you kind of touch any state marginally, you kind of have to destroy that kind of uh, piece of the state and kind of recreate it at the end of the uh, at the end of the uh, Excel spreadsheet in your example again. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, it is. It is a problem with privacy preserving systems. Um, so take 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 Ethereum for example. If I want to send some Ethereum to somebody, my Ethereum balance gets modified, um, which in Ethereum's cost model is five thousand gas. If I wanted to create a new account from scratch and, and add a balance which didn't exist before, it's twenty thousand gas. Uh, privacy preserving systems have this um, uh, problem felt it felt it's felt a bit more acutely because if you want to modify an existing um, variable, you need to um, create some information that destroys it. Um, that's why one storage slots you could consider, um, and then you have to recreate the the variable in somewhere else, which is two storage slots. So it does the the data throughput of a private um, privacy preserving blockchain uh, is a lot higher than a transparent public chain, which is why data availability solutions are so important to us. Um, and things like EIP four eight four four. There are other. Um, ways to to mitigate this cost as well, um, particularly maybe, maybe I think we, something else. I, I don't want to jump the gun a little bit um, by going into this, but the in order to build complex privacy preserving applications, it's not enough to have private state because the problem with private state is that it's encrypted and therefore effectively is owned by somebody or a set of individuals. Um, the, the, the people who possess knowledge of the decryption key effectively own that state. Um, and if you don't have that decryption key, you can't change it, which creates some large some some problems when it comes to creating complex applications. Any smart contract that requires a global state, this, this model doesn't work. Um, take, for example, if I'm building a DEX and I needed, uh, I'm creating a liquidity pool, so I need to know how, much, how many tokens I have of a given, um, of a given token type. Uh, that needs to be public information um, that uh, is constantly upda- updated every time a entity deposits into the into the liquidity pool. You can't make that private, not without very complex multi-party computations that are slightly beyond the scope of what we're trying to do, at least in the next couple of years. And so what you really need for complex private applications is hybrid state. Um, you need private state, which is encrypted. It's owned by individuals. Um, you don't know when it's created. You don't know when it's destroyed. You don't know who owns it. You don't know which contracts control the state, um, and, and it's UTXO based. And then you have regular, normy account-based public state, which operate, which acts, operates and acts just like Ethereum's state model does. And 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 smart contracts have the ability to modify both. Okay, let let's kind of dig into this a little bit. Say, for instance, I have um, private uh, a private account with kind of private token balances, no one knows it's me, sort of thing. Um, and I want to um, interact with a public AMM. Um, how would that work? And what of the information that kind of I divulge um, becomes public? And how do you make sure that it's not traceable back to me? 
I can start maybe with the, the user experience. So I guess it it comes from the fact uh, that, that on Aztec, an account is is defined by a private smart contract, um, not not an externally owned account like Ethereum. So effectively, when whenever you do a transaction on, on Aztec, you satisfy the conditions of your private account. So it starts as a private transaction. So you, you modify some private state. Um, and then if you're if your kind of function call calls a, a Uniswap contract, um, you'll probably set up that uh, swap in the private realm. So you'll migrate some of your DAI balance um, to uh, the Uniswap uh, uh, private contract um, before you kind of send it to the public land for the AMM swap. But you'll do all of that in, in the private realm, client side, local to your device. And then the last thing that the kind of private uh, setup function in the Uniswap contract will do is make a public um, public L2 call to kind of execute the swap. Um, so leading up to that point, um, all that you can see on the L2 is someone somewhere modified some state uh, that resulted in uh, this public L2 call. Um, and then the contents of that L2 call will have some public information uh, defined by kind of the protocol you're calling. So in Uniswap's case, it will likely be the asset you're trying to swap, um, maybe some slippage um, and like a notional, um, but you can't see anything about what led up to that point um, to kind of leak further information. So you can't see my address, you can't see see anything like that. Um, you can just see that it's a valid private transaction leading up to that point. And at that point, kind of the sequencer takes over um, and can kind of execute that much like a public transaction on on any other L2. I can try and sum, like, um, summarize. So this is what I'm about to describe is abstracted away from the user experience. Um, um, but functionally, what would happen under the hood is you unshield to a random address. Um, so if I want to swap 10 ETH into DAI, I unshield 10 ETH to a random address. No one knows. So, so 10 ETH has popped up. It's owned by like OX like, you know, X for particular, no one knows who that is because it's just created just for this transaction. Then that um, that money then gets put into Uniswap for, uh, let's say, ETH to die trade. And so people will see that the amounts of, they will see that ETH got unshielded from somebody. They will see that, but they don't know who, they will see that ETH gets put into Uniswap and they'll see some die coming out. Um, the die will be recovered by that, like random address. Uh, and then um, that die will get shielded into the my my the my private account, and again you can you can construct it such that you don't know um, that that shielding action also provides you with no information. So you you effectively you get anonymity, you hide the identities of the people interacting, but you, the protocol logic is transparent, so you still know the the values going through Uniswap. The the imagination that's cropping up in my mind is like this idea of a public square and private houses where um where i mean you have a public square and whatever happens like in in, in a town I and mean, then whatever happens in the public square is kind of trackable seeable when you have right. you have private houses and in principle what happens inside my house is is just known to me and maybe in in Aztec, you know, the Aztec state can be visualized as the combination of both the public square and the private houses. Where um, anytime, anytime I kind of interact privately with myself or with another users, I have an anonymity set of all of the private houses. So I, let's say, I send money from like my house to another house. Um, from the outside, nobody knows what house the money came from and where it went except except the owners of these two houses sort of but then when i want to interact with an amm i can suddenly transport teleport my money from one of these private houses seemingly into the public square in do a trade which might be an exchange of one coin into another coin in the public square everybody sees that like the public square activity is kind of genuine and then and then that resulting coin i can again transport back into my private house 
and the anonymity set is again the set of all private houses. So nobody exactly knows which private house it went into, but it actually went into my private house. Kind of that is. A, I think that's a, that's a great analogy. I, I could extend it a bit um, with some kind of because um, it's not just like going from the house to a a particular stall in in the public square. Um, you can effectively imagine that uh, you can route your 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 funds or your data through through any house around the square, and you have to follow the logic to find in that house. So let's say there's a let's say there's a kind of um, a customs officer who does some sort of um, stamping that this is this is a legitimate trade coming through. You can write a, a stool in the public square that will only accept um, kind of transactions that could have come through a certain path, um, uh, which is defined by the logic of a composable smart contract. And you could then also um, have two public square stalls that could talk to each other. So um, there's full composability between all the houses kind of on, on, on the outside of the square and all the stalls inside the square. So it's not just a case of kind of how it was in Aztec Connect, where it's a bit more single shot, where you can go and do one one interaction with your asset. The interaction scope is defined by the contract and the set of functions um, that the developer writes, which can cross private to public boundaries. So um, actually, that's that's really interesting, right? So now there's like actually, you can maybe imagine that three sets of you know land. One is like the public square. One is these private stalls, which are basically the private smart contracts, as I see it. And then maybe these houses are kind of like the ends accounts of the users that are holding the coins. Maybe we can imagine it like that. And you've kind of mentioned this kind of interaction where I could start from like the end house, go into a stall, prove something to the private smart contract. And then that uh, that sends the funds into the public public pool. Something happens in the public pool. Then it goes back to a stall. And then it goes back to a private house. Could you give me an example of a real world application that would have such a such a flow yeah i can do an obvious one um i guess which we don't see on 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 chain right now but kind of consumer finance so i could i could prove something about my um my private house which is kind of the income coming into it from from my job i could prove that to a, a private stool which is kind of a, a loan broker um and that that stool can give me a credit score um and i can take that credit score uh, to the to the public square um, and receive a loan based on that credit score into my into my private account and kind of the only thing that's been made public in, in that interaction is that someone's asking for a loan and they have a credit score of above 600 um, but they, they, it's not revealing which house it was or, or anything like that or any of the information about the proof that was required by by the kind of credit score um, private store. So that was one analogy. There's KYC checks. Um, also some interesting game state that Zach's been thinking about as well. Cool. Yeah, I think I understand um, the vision of kind of where you guys uh, want this to be at. Talk me through the technical roadmap and the challenges that you face along the way. So, I mean, even for... Um, I mean, all of us, we're eternally optimistic about timelines. I mean, I've been wrong about this many times. And for you guys to say um, you will have this ready by the end of next year, sounds like there are some major roadblocks in the way. Uh, so I'll do the short-term roadmap and then Zach, Zach can kind of fill in some of the, the major obstacles because there's there's definitely a few roadblocks uh, in, in our path. But um, what we've been able to do for the roadmap is to kind of condense which parts are needed for mainnet uh, and, and kind of put those in one bucket and, and then separate that bucket from which parts are needed for developers to kind of start to write applications and test out what's possible in this new this new design space. And so in, in, in the second bucket, um, we've actually managed to kind of remove a lot of the, the heavy lifting away from uh, the protocol and just define an optimistic version of the protocol, which we're calling Aztec Sandbox. Um, and we're, we're hopefully going to have a, a release of that uh, in early kind of Q3. Um, so you'll be able to kind of take that, run it a bit like a local Ganache or Foundry node and write programs in, in our smart contract uh, language, blah, um, against that. So test out 
these types new types of applications as soon as kind of Q3 this year. Um, and then we'll kind of expand that uh, functionality with a with a more centralized actual test net with persistent state so you can interact with other people's applications, not just just local ones, which we're targeting uh, towards the end of the year. Uh, and then we'll expand that again with a kind of decentralized test net um, uh, in in kind of early 2024. Um, and then the rest of it will be kind of filling all the blanks in to actually get this onto mainnet, which uh, Zach can talk a bit about the challenges on, on on that journey because it can no longer be optimistic at that point. Yeah, so I guess the well, one of the reasons for the for the long roadmap is is because we we we're also like aware of how how optimistic timelines normally are in this industry, and we've fallen prey to this ourselves in the past where we've internally been far too optimistic about how long it would take us to execute on building Aztec on Aztec Connect. And so part of the reason for the end of 2024 timeline is because we actually want to hit this one. Um, it's uh, it's not two years op- optimistic, it isn't two years, um, but uh, well, one and a half now. There are three key, I would say, core technical components to, to, to Aztec. One of them is the um, is decentralization. As just said, like, we want to launch on mainnet decentralized from day one um there's the there's what, what we like what i guess can be termed heavy engineering which is just like building out the node architecture the software to, to run a node to run a sequencer um like this the, the 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 kind of the core protocol level technology and then there's cryptography um, which is actually building out our, our cryptography backend software like the the actual algorithms that we'll be constructing these are knowledge proofs and verifying them uh, and um, and and also, I guess, on demo cryptography is also the the circuit architecture. Actually, building out the zk circuits that will go, like govern um, this entire protocol. Uh, just the heavy engineering work alone, I would I would I, I think is is I would I would wager is more complicated than um, many other um, like, uh, L two projects out there, just because of the complexities around this hybrid state model. Um, and then on top of that, you have this um, like decentralization uh, track where we're building out a decentralized sequencer, um, non-trivial. And then there's the cryptography, which is uh, there's a reason why no one's really attempted anything at the scale before, and that's because the crypto just isn't wasn't good enough. Um, uh, it took a lot of work to make it good enough. Uh, there's been a ton of advancements over the last um, few years, uh, some of which we played a hand in, but. Uh, we're confident we're in a place now where the fundamental proving tech is fast enough to construct these very complicated zero knowledge proofs um, in a um, on resource constrained platforms like laptops, like phones, in web browsers. Um, but it's going to take a while to build that out uh, and audit it and make sure that it's secure. Yeah, to give you an idea, maybe of the kind of uh, cryptographic kind of challenges. So I think for for, for these programs to actually run in the browser, you have to prove the correct execution of a set of rules. So you have to know that private program has uh, kind of, it's only updating uh, or adding UTXOs um, that it owns and signatures in the checked, fees have been paid. All of these rules that, that are defined by the protocol have to be kind of uh, checked by, by uh, a protocol level circuit. And every time you call a smart contract uh, on Aztec, you have to do that proof. Um, and and you do that through recursion. And over the years, I mean, I think with Aztec Aztec 2, we used to do recursion in our roll-up circuit, and it would be done on a 32-core uh, kind of machine in AWS, and it would take minutes to kind of do a, a single recursion. Um, with some of the latest work we're doing for some L1 private voting work, we've got it down to 15 seconds in the browser. Uh, but for, for Aztec, uh, Aztec 3 or the next version of Aztec, um, we need to be able to do multiple levels of recursion for a single transaction in kind of a couple of seconds. So we've got to go down another order of magnitude, um, which which is probably a nice segue into uh, some of the cryptography research and, and, and Goblin Plonk uh, that, that we've been working on. Um, just to kind of um, repackage this a little bit and basically the the entire computation that has to happen client side that's because you want to divulge as little information as possible and you kind of create the 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 proofs client side instead of just sending it somewhere right basically if i send like um, a vanilla ethereum transaction 
that that's like literally zero computational overhead for me. I just send it um, to the mempool and that's it. But basically, because part of the system runs client side, this kind of uh, creates this overhead that needs to be handled in browser or in the client. Correct. Yeah, the private the private side of the system all has to run client side. So before we get into like the cryptography, um, the novel cryptography Goblin Plonk that that you have created, um, I am actually curious how the system you are targeting differs from Mina, which is another one of these systems that are building privacy preserving smart contracts. Is it the case that these are radically different visions? Or are they similar visions with different technical approaches? I think they're somewhat similar visions, but from very different perspectives. Um, when we, there's the reason why we've only recently embarked on building this program elastic network is because we weren't comfortable with the state of ZK cryptographies. And we figured what we really want to do, it'll be too slow. Uh, the previous will be too slow. It'll be a bad user experience. Uh, effectively, what we want to do is we want what we build to look and talk and quack like a smart contract where you don't need to be a cryptographer to write smart contracts. You, it's like We've got this language called Noir. It's, for, it's called a Rust-like syntax. Uh, it's But um, anybody using it, at least in its full version, it should, it should feel somewhat familiar to Solidity in terms of how it operates. It differs slightly from Mina in that, so obviously I'm, I'm not an expert on Mina, so I don't want to mischaracterize what they're doing. Uh, so um, with Mina, the getting the kind of composability that you get in Ethereum is, is, is possible, but it's, it's a little bit more involved where you need to sequence what would normally be one transaction over many transactions. And uh, I don't believe they have their own like specific smart contract programming language. At, at, the, at its core, the, the thing about Aztec's architecture is that we want full composability, which means we want contracts to be able to call other contracts that can call contracts that can call contracts. And effectively, each contract call is its, has to be its own zero knowledge proof of correctness. And therefore, you need, in, if, you want, if you want that kind of composability at a bare minimum, you need a, some kind of higher level ZK circuit that the, that the user, the client is running, creating a proof of that will verify all of these private contract calls and sequence them properly so that like they're, they're, they're all, the call semantics are all correct and everything is, is the rules are all being followed. In reality, it's actually much more convenient and more practical to do multiple arbitrary layers of recursion. So you, you have lots of proofs, verifying proofs, verifying proofs, verifying proofs. And I believe my understanding is at least when Mina launched that wasn't really practical um, to to do client side, uh, so that they've taken a different approach. Um, but that's kind of where my my understanding of the protocol ends, and, and I don't want to mischaracterize what they're doing. It is is a extremely impressive project, and yeah, um, I I just think that they've made some slightly different design choices. I think part of them are motivated by the fact that they're layer one, so they they um they have different uh, requirements to us as well on that front. Right, so. Is it fair to think that you are betting on kind of like this recursive proving kind of architecture? Because fundamentally, as we said, like there are like private houses, stalls, and then public squares. And then my my big transaction has to go from a private house to a stall to a public square, back to a private stall to a private house. So it has to touch all of those pieces. And somehow like the recursion is you take one step and you generate a proof for it, and then the next step verifies the proof for the first step, does something, generates a proof for both the steps together. Then the it goes to the public square, that's like step three. It verifies the proofs for the first two steps, does something, generates a proof for the entire thing, and so on. So this is essentially why you need recursion. Sort of. Maybe I can try and rephrase that because it's, it's not quite that iterative. So what happens is, imagine, imagine if you're if you imagine you're moving between private houses and you're moving between private stalls, uh, and like each action, like each time you're between, let's call that a step. What you really need is you need some entity monitoring these steps, checking that they're all following the rules. Basically, you have some kind of spy that's spying on the on your on your actions, going, okay, 
is this step correct? Is this step correct? Is this correct? Correct. This is what we call the the kernel circuit. It's, it's the nomenclature is borrowed from from Zexy. So effectively, the kernel circuit uh, is is the entity like the the that verifies all these steps are correct. And obviously, because it's basically acting like a giant spy, um, the proof of the kernel circuit must be made client side. Uh, with a, you leak so you you leak way too much information if you send it to a third party, and that kernel circuit is doing lots and lots of recursion. And um, you also it's it's more practical to architect things such that the you actually have recursion at the, at the kernel circuit level. So you can think about it. One one way of thinking about it, like um, is that you have this kernel circuit, which what it'll do is it'll it'll verify that one of these steps between like the private houses, the private stores is correct, and that's it. Um, but but what the kernel circuit also does is it verifies a previous iteration of itself. So you have a kernel circuit for step one, verify step one, and then at step two you have a kernel circuit that verifies step two, and the kernel circuit that verifies step one. Um, and on and on you go until you've you've made all of your private um, steps, and then you step out into the public sphere, and then that that proof of the kernel circuit gets kicked off to a sequencer to complete the transaction. And so that's um, it requires a lot of compu- uh, complexity to, to 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 pull that off um, in a zk system. Right, and so your fundamentally your these Aztec wallets will need to be able to generate these recursive proofs inside the browser. And like that's also going to be an engineering challenge to build wallets of such complexity. Yes. So so we, we know how to do the cryptography. At least we're very confident we do. Uh, but it's but turning turning it from paper to code is is not a trivial process. The plan is that the um we will be Maybe Joe can speak about this more, but what we're calling an Aztec wallet is it's more of a it's something that it's something that if you're actually building a proper like wallet um, to manage Aztec funds, you would you would incorporate our software within it. It's basically um it acts like a little bit like a miniature node that uh um it's a bit like consider like web3.js or ethers.js, one anything like that. Like we're building an equivalent like Aztec.js and you can make calls to it to to construct these proofs. Um, so we're, the goal is to abstract all of that away from the actual, like from application developers. Yeah, like for 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 kind of like an end web page, um, you'll connect your your version of Aztec JS, which will be running uh, like an RPC client server model, um, and and your wallet is basically implementing that through through our open source software, and that kind of gives you access to private state management. Um, so which UTXOs are yours um, and also kind of the ability to simulate and execute uh, these private smart contract programs and, and ultimately construct the proofs. So we can do some of the kind of engineering uh, for wallets um, to kind of make this uh, a little bit easier. Uh, but there is still a lot of a, a lot of work ahead of us to actually get it fast enough uh, to be a good user experience, um, which which is kind of the extended timeline we have here. So I assume that the amount of gas that you have to pay on Aztec is also uh, linearly co- um, related to the computation. But it seems to me that as a user, you can't always know how much computation you actually have to touch in order to do something. Because basically you say if, if, like, um, if you're touching a state that like a thousand people have access rights to, you kind of need to update that accordingly right so basically if you add like one more person who can update something you kind of need to deploy an entire entirely new contract to do that um i mean if i do some something on ethereum i kind of know um what kind of gas is attached to any of the opcodes that i use and kind of it modifies that state is that necessarily apparent on aztec i can try maybe for the Private private world, and then Zach, do you want to talk about gas metering in, in the public world? Because I, I guess in, in in the private world, you you don't pay for compute um, because the act of executing uh, the kernel proof is is proving that you've done the compute correctly. Yeah, so you've done compute, it. You've done it yourself, right? Yeah, so compute is effectively free. But what 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 you're right in saying is what you will pay for is kind of the 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 state reads uh, and and writes and, and nullifications that result from that compute um 
and that's that's where there will be a kind of a, a gas cost for for the private world um and you can kind of you can see that based on what the smart contract's doing uh kind of what that will be but it could result in a variable gas cost for uh, a certain transaction based on your utxos under the hood so that that's kind of um one thing we're hopeful that's going to be solved by by eip 4844 if the cost of data goes down a lot uh, it should become cheap to do private transactions um and then when you get to the public world it does act a lot more like ethereum um because someone else is doing the compute there so the the metering there there will be opcodes uh in in kind of the public land that, that will get metered um and you'll pay a fee that has to cover uh, the cost of the sequencer both executing that, but also then constructing a proof of correct execution for the public transaction. Yeah, just to expand on that um, and to summarize. So for for privates for the private domain, you 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 pay for state rights, um, and you don't. Pay, I don't believe you pay for state reads. It's just state rights, uh, and uh, things like events, which are, again was kind of your broadcasting data. Um, and in the public world, yeah, it's much more familiar gas metering like it is on Ethereum. But just like if you think about Ethereum, uh, most relatively complex contract calls do have a variable gas cost. If I'm calling Uniswap, I don't know the like the routing logic affects how much I'm going to pay. And so how do you figure out how much gas your transaction is going to be? Well, you simulate it client side before you send it. You do the same on Aztec. Simulation of transactions is very cheap because you're not making any zero rules proofs if you're just running the, the logic. So you can you can figure out ahead of time, okay, how much is it going to cost before you actually go through the effort of building the ZK proof and sending the transaction. Cool. I have a couple more questions as to roadmap. So um, you talked about um, like the different buckets and I kind of want to dive into the heavy engineering bucket for now. Um, so you already talked about sequencer decentralization as kind of part of that to-do list. Um, w will that Will your sequencer be fully decentralized by the time mainnet launches? Because none of the other um, layer tools have done that, right? So basically, everyone's still fighting with with um, sequencer decentralization at this point. And basically, if if I were to know that any of the other L tools were to be able to solve this by the end of next year, um, that that would greatly alleviate many of the concerns I have about the L two ecosystem. So is that already kind of priced in? Yeah, I guess, I guess some of the the rationale for this this line of engineering is 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 based on kind of the the nature of our network and and our desire for it to be kind of uh, incredibly neutral and have kind of complete liveness. Um, and I guess so. So we're we're based in the UK, and then like some of our our colleagues are based in Europe, and some are based in in the US. And no one at the moment can agree on on crypto regulation. So um, we we feel like uh, for any one entity to run. Uh, a sequencer that deals with encrypted state um, is is a is a bit of a kind of fool's errand. Um, so we're looking for kind of multiple uh, sequencers to run, which can maybe kind of conform to different regulatory requirements if they if they need to, or or just act as like a decentralized, uh, incredibly neutral layer, much like Ethereum does. So that's some of the the rationale, and we face this pressure a bit more than some of the public zk EVM based L twos because. Uh, they can kind of just run centralized sequences and have kind of a, a path to uh, decentralization, um, which I think is part of the reason why no one's made significant inroads here yet, because it's 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 not the most pressing problem. Uh, but for us, we feel like it's something that's needed for for launch. And then I guess like like how we get there, um, yeah, we're we're kind of still in the in the RFP design phase uh, we've had some some public um, kind of discussions on our forum and some great submissions from external teams on on how best to do this uh, but really yeah we're looking for a proposal that can take the technology we've built and ensure that uh, if enough entities are running it the network can remain live and and with a good kind of throughput and user experience for for developers so that's kind of the, the high level goals here but it, it is going to be an engineering challenge to actually uh, launch this, uh, but that's why we're starting now, not 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 towards the end of next year. Yes, so so it is it is priced in, but it is also the biggest unknown unknown uh, on the roadmap. Okay, so um, cryptography, you guys just started talking about this, um, and we kind of uh, got sidetracked a little bit. Um, talk to us about 
Plonk and Goblin Plonk. Happy to, yeah. So, so Plonk was, um, we put together Plonk um, in 2019. So by, in, in the standards of ZK, how quickly ZK crypto moves in this industry, Plonk is absolutely ancient. Uh, <laughs> um, and it was really the first um, practical uh, universal snark, as in it was, it was, it was a, you could write ZK circuits in it where you didn't need to con- perform this trusted setup process per circuit. Things have moved along a lot since 2019, um, where um, you know we've upgraded the plonk so from Terra plonk to plonk to Terra plonk to ultra plonk, and now there's hyper plonk. And the, the, there's been a lot of innovations that have happened over the last two years. Particularly, one of them is that we, as in the collective cri- cryptography community, um, c- uh, has cracked how to construct uh, like plonkish type systems using using a cryptographic primitive called a sum check. Um, which is much more efficient and faster than we, what we were using earlier. Um, for us, this is a very big deal because it use, using um, it, it removes the, the need to perform a, like an algorithm called the fast Fourier transform, which is very very memory hungry. And so, um, the latest iteration of Plonk of the building, which we're calling a Honk for highly optimized Plonk, uh, the P is silent. Um, is uh, it uses some checks, and we, we're confident the memory consumption will be once it's optimized at least a 20% of what it currently is um, with things like Aztec Connect. And so that's that's a huge deal, um, particularly in, when you're trying to run a prover in a browser tab. Um, and then there's the a lot of development and work that's been happening on what are called folding schemes, which is effective. It's a way of performing recursion, verifying proofs inside proofs more efficiently than what's come before. And Goblin Plonk is kind of a slightly orthogonal Piece of research there, which uh, complements folding schemes, but it makes it it's it's effectively a way of doing recursion um, efficiently. It, it takes what like every when you're using elliptic curves and you want to verify proof inside a proof, you've got to do this. It's called like non non native um, elliptic curve arithmetic. You you've you've got to do some, some very complicated uh, mathematical operations that are difficult to emulate inside a zk snark circuit, and Goblin Plonk kind of rem- mostly removes that. Um, Difficulty uh, and makes them relatively easy to do, and so you combine goblin plot with folder schemes and 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 plot with some checks, and you mash it all together and into a ball, and you get a proving system which is fast enough for Aztec. It can do recursion client side super quickly. Memory consumption is really light, which means you can run complex circuits in a browser, and the proofs are fast enough to to deal with the the overheads. At least that's the uh, that's the goal. That sounds wonderful. How worried are you about using novel cryptography in production? Because basically, it's like it's like super complex math, uh, complex maths, uh, and basically all it takes is like a single vulnerability, right? Yes, but we that is true. Um, however, we're not. We have the luxury that we have we have our own kind of in house crypto R and D team. A lot of the research we publish ourselves with our own proof of security. So we understand the tech at a much deeper level than a typical um, software um, development outfit, a much deeper level. And so that gives us some, comp- we, so we, we have a lot of confidence that the tech we deploy is secure at the cryptography layer, as in the proof of security are good, the soundness is good, it's secure. There's obviously, when you're implementing novel cryptography for, for the first time, the, the biggest risk is in the software, that your software doesn't actually do what the paper um, needs to uh, like the maths in the paper. There's a bug. There's some issue. There's something you haven't seen, which which causes it to become uh, insecure. And so that's one layer layer that errors can creep in. It's like the implementation of the cryptography. The other layer that errors creep in is uh, at the circuit level. Um, one of the big issues with zk snark circuit design is under constrained circuits. Basically, the circuit's supposed to be enforcing logical rules that make sure that your Transaction is 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 correct and it can't double spend. However, one one of the most common types of bugs is where well actually the, the logical rules you're applying are slightly more relaxed than you intended because you've written program you've written your second correctly. That's quite common. You know we've we've experienced when we deployed Aztec Connect uh, and and Aztec Two we we did have under constrained circuit bugs that some of us, some of them we found um, a couple were reported externally by third parties um, through a bug bounty. 
uh, all of them we fix and disclose publicly, but it does happen. And so there are some, yes, there are, there are technical risks with building advanced cryptography systems and deploying them to production. It's one of the reasons why our, why our timeline is, is so long is so we have a long, longer time to audit everything. Uh, but ultimately, one of the one of the frustrating things is that sometimes, like, if any applied cryptographer or cryptographer t- comes to you and says, "I can build secure cryptography software, hundred percent, no bugs," they're either lying to you or to themselves. So I can't say that when we launch on mainnet, everything's going to be perfect, everything's going to work, and there's not going to be any security issues. What I can say is that we're going to have done our absolute utmost to like to to to, to audit the security to validate that what we're doing is correctly moving very methodically as we build this. And we have a very generous and open um, bug bounty um, so that to help incentivize um, third parties to, to, to review, to, to audit. We wouldn't recommend that people throw very large sums of money through Aztec in the first year of this operation. Uh, because ultimately, the, the, only re- the, the only thing that really proves a crypto cryptography protocol is time. Um, this has been the case not just in ZK and Web3, but like forever, um, really. Even nowadays, the fundamental security assumptions that back elliptic curves, that you can't solve this computational problem called the discrete logarithm problem. We don't have a proof that you can't solve it. <laughs> it's just that no one's cracked it for 30 years. Uh, so we just we're like, okay, fine. Um, it's probably good. Yeah, basically, we're going to do our absolute most utmost to internally, externally validate our software, move methodically. You know, we've done this before twice now, um, which is quite rare in this in, in this sector um, to have deployed advanced ZK crypto, ZK rollups to production twice. We've done that. We've got experience. We're going to use all of the, all of what we've learned to make sure that we've done as good a job as possible. Uh, and then we will have a very generous bug bounty to be engaged with the community to try and help us spot issues as and when they come up. And we would expect that basically the, the people's comfort with Aztec and like they're, they're how many? How this volume of funds that people are comfortable putting in, that we're comfortable seeing co- going to Aztec, will just increase over time. The the longer that we uh, remain bug free. There's some things as well, um, which kind of have extended our timeline in terms of like client diversity and working out what that looks like on on Aztec. So um, there may be parts of the system um, where multiple implementations help get that confidence. Um, so once we've kind of got a reference implementation built, uh, maybe it's for the roll-up proofs or maybe it's just for the verifiers, um, there may be ways to build in kind of extra redundancy um, that I guess two implementations have to agree at the same code. And that's something that we'll be starting kind of uh, in 2024 once we have the full protocol nailed down working on testnet uh, for other teams to start building reference implementations, so building other implementations off our reference implementation to get extra uh, security and help spot bugs um, that way. So maybe one final question. So in the history of this blockchain technology, um, I've often encountered a pattern where some capability emerges and then people realize that it's not enough and then the next uh, version emerges with more capability, and then they realize that is not enough, and then the third version emerges where they realize it's not enough, maybe fourth version emerges, and then like it turns out like that actually addresses most use cases, and that becomes really widespread. So typical example might be, you started off with Bitcoin, okay, I can send coins, and I can write a bunch of uh, fourth-like scripts, then people realized, okay, it's not enough to just send coins in a decentralized fashion. We need to do derivatives contracts. So a master coin, colored coin, all those things came up. Then came Ethereum uh, with a virtual machine. And it's like, turns out the Ethereum is really enough for uh, a massive uh, spectrum of activities. And then maybe like in the last 10 years, if you look at public smart contracts, very little has been built on top of the EVM itself. Maybe maybe we can say Solana did parallelization of transaction processing and maybe that's an innovation. People still doubt it, right? So uh, so that happened in, in that space. Similarly, in the privacy space, I see that uh, in the beginning, you started off all, out with zero coin, then came Zcash that did the cash aspect well. 
And now when you did the cash aspect, well, the natural consequence was, hey, can we do smart contracts? Well, and now you're tackling that. And in your vision, if your vision is achieved, do you think like there is that next layer of privacy preserving smart contract systems that's that's still possible? Are there like elements of your system where developers don't have certain functionality and you will actually need to build a Aztec V4 or somebody will need to build the next generation of privacy preserving smart contracts? Or do you think that your capabilities actually nail the privacy preserving smart contract space and that's the EVM of the future in that space? I can, I can feel that question. Obviously, I'm John, I'm very biased on this. Um, my answer to that would be yes, but just to, to go back a bit and speak more widely, um, like you're, you're absolutely right on the observation about like this, this iterative incremental progress. I mean, this is the really the fourth iteration of a private transaction system that we've built um, going, going back from six years ago. And the frustration has always been, like, we've always wanted to do complex privacy-preserving tr- transactions, but it's always the tech's never been there, like the crypto isn't good enough, crypto isn't good enough, try and make the crypto good enough, and it's always like, as soon as we crest like some capability threshold, we're like, okay, we can do some something more. So like originally Aztec was confidential transactions on layer one, very expensive. You didn't get an anonymity, you just hid, hid your balances. It was not that great, but it was the best we could do. Then we came up with Plonk, I'm like, oh great, okay, we can use this to now do something better. We can actually make a proper, basically like Zcash from Ethereum, where you can shield Ethereum, let's do that. And we did that with Aztec too, and I'm like, mm, but this isn't quite good enough. Um, uh, is we wanted full programmability, and we couldn't get there. But we're like, okay, we've got this. We got we got Teleplon, We got recursion. Let's let's interact with DeFi. Let's do like layer two to layer one in like DeFi interactions and 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 um, transaction matching. We can do that. So we did that. We did launch Asset Connect. And now finally, finally, we have the tech where we're like, okay, we can do now what we wanted to do all along, which was programmable privacy. So the way I see things evolving, at least for Aztec, is that I do see us like. You know, pack downing our tools and going home once we've launched the Aztec network. But I, I do see that um, feature enhancements are iterative and not um, revolutionaries, and there'll be upgrades to the, the existing Aztec network and not completely new architectures that are deployed. Uh, because I do think that we've summited the, the overwhelming majority of all of the thresholds that we've been trying to, to cross. But speaking more widely, are there any other frontiers, any other like game changes that can happen down the line? There are two that I can see. One is less speculative than the other. The, the, I think the next big threshold is multi-party computation. Uh, with the systems that we're enabling with Aztec, you can get um, single person, like single user privacy, and then um, you interact with transparent protocols in this public private square description that you just that you that you, that you mentioned earlier. What would be very nice is if there is no public square, everything is private. Uh, but then that that requires a, lot, a large amount of coordination with a large number of entities that all cannot, um, like they all they they all cannot like know uh, any any anything about the people they're interacting with. That requires NPCs. They're very, much more complicated um, to to execute on. You have di- you have different worse trust assumptions um, as that you have to you have to work around, and the, the transaction complexity is a lot higher because you're interacting with a large number of. In- other individuals. However, we do think that Aztec is basically the network where that'll happen. What we're excited, one of the things we're excited about with Aztec is that it's we see it as basically an NPC incubator because Aztec smart contracts are the perfect execution environment to um, to to run a NPC protocol on uh, because you have this decentralized um, like validate like validation logic that everyone can trust that can modify um, private state shared state. It's it's, it's 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 what you need, and we're going to be launching with MPC primitives built in to the our uh, programming language Noir. However, we do anticipate it'll take a while for people to experiment with these and actually build advanced systems. The 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 biggest um, game changer, which I think is a long way away, if it really ever if I'm still I'm not sure what's going to happen at, within a, within ten years or even twenty years, maybe twenty, is fully homomorphic. Encryption, but more than that, verifiable fully homomorphic encryption. So, um, where so FHE is a bit of a holy grail, where instead of proving that a computation is correct, so I have some secret data, I can I can prove to you that it follows some rules. You 
encrypt your secrets, you give them to some, some other schmuck, and they, they run the program for you, but they don't know anything about the, the algorithm they're running, they don't know anything about the data. That's FHE. It's much harder to do, it's much slower. The amount of information that's um, required is much higher. Both of these are problems for, for in the blockchain protocol. And within a blockchain protocol, what you really actually want is you want to verify an FHE computation that's been correctly performed. Um, so you want to say, I gave my I gave my encrypted data to some third party schmuck. They ran an FHE program. Here's the output. And by the way, this this all happened. Is and you don't have to trust me when I say an FHE program was run. And so that means taking a very 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 complex computer operation like an FHE algorithm and then running that inside a snark. Mm, that's 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 the the real holy grail. But I don't. To be honest, I don't see that happening for quite a long time to come. And yeah, Aztec isn't really built around that um, because it's it's a bit too speculative. So it's like, what is like the man on the street capability? Meaning like, okay, I understand the man on the street capability for Aztec, which is uh, my coins are private. I can hit a smart contract, get get a credit score private. And then I can go to the public square, borrow money based on my credit score, and then I can go back to the private world. MPC seems to be, yeah, you can do all that, but you really don't even need to go to the public square uh, to take the loan. The, the loan will also be granted to you on some kind of private square. Everything's private. But what does FHE provide me beyond beyond that? I already feel like that's enough for me. I think so too, which is why we're not focusing on it and giving its technical hurdles. But I think with LHE, you might, maybe, might be able to actually create private Ethereum. Maybe. Uh, as in, just take regular Ethereum, wrap it in, not in ZK, but FHE, where you use oblivious, um, like oblivious RAM to, like, um, to, to, to do the, the state updates. And you might be able to make that fully private with some tweaks. Ah, uh, so we can have the account model of Ethereum completely, and smart contract writing behaves exactly like Ethereum, but the whole thing is obfuscated. Possibly, I'm a little uncertain myself. Uh, but you have a very different execution there, basically, if it if it is possible, and 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 I think, yeah, like there, we did some early kind of tests on 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 using some some kind of FHE methods to help retrieve Aztec UTXOs and uh, the compute required is is eye-watering. So it, it's, I think, to, to even match Ethereum's throughput on today's protocols, it's just a complete non-starter. Um, uh, but it's it's fun to kind of put put pie in the sky and see, see where things can things to get to, and maybe it will become faster than, uh, than, than we all think, but uh, it seems quite far away right now. I have one more final question. Seriously, last final question. You have made the somewhat controversial decision to sunset Aztec Connect to kind of focus on building Aztec 3 and kind of leaving um, everyone who had kind of so far um, entrusted themselves to you and your company in building on Aztec Connect somewhat high and dry. Can you walk us through that decision process? Because I, I t totally see that kind of maintaining something um, where you don't know whether there's an upgrade path to the successor um, is a pain, but also kind of, frankly, pissing off the people who've so far kind of built on your protocol. It's probably not a great business move. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, I guess... Um... I, I would kind of dispute the the, the high and dry. Um, like we've we've made all of the code fully open source, um, and if people people want to take the network and kind of take on the costs of of running it from a maintenance standpoint and and just re resources, we, we encourage that. Um, we we can put the the, the code links in in, in the repository in, in the podcast. And for for users, um, we've kind of offered free withdrawals um, for the for the next year. So we're, we're hopeful that. Um, even though it's it's not a decision that uh, some a, a lot of users kind of agree with because they were using the product and enjoying it, they shouldn't be kind of out of pocket because of because of that. And um, we're very hopeful that once once Aztec three uh, or Aztec the next version goes live, um, they'll they'll come across and kind of try 
the, the wealth of new applications um, that, that are there. Um, and from our community, at least of developers, they're all very excited to try the sandbox. So I think we've managed to kind of protect uh, against burning burning bridges there where possible. And I guess on, on the rationale, under the hood, like it had a lot of usage uh, Aztec Connect, um, and that came with uh, costs. So we had kind of close to 200,000 kind of users. Um, and uh, for a, a company like ours, we're still small. Like we may, may have raised um, uh, kind of venture funding, but we, w- we were spending kind of close to half of our engineering resources on on keeping that live. Um, and we kind of felt that it was uh, not just normal engineering resources that were like replaceable and we could scale up. These are kind of ZK Snark based brains uh, that are not really re- uh, kind of scalable. So uh, it really came down to kind of, can we keep this live, work out how to upgrade it and decentralize it at the same time as building something as ambitious as, as, as Aztec? And just the math said no. Um, so it, yeah, it came down to being a business decision um, on getting Aztec out by the end of 2024 or, or not really at all. Um, so that's what kind of forced our hand there. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, if people want to keep abreast of um, developments um, going towards Aztec 3, Where's the best place they can follow you on Twitter or Discord or your forum or f- what would you recommend? Yeah, I'd say the forum. Um, so we're, we're trying uh, to do a lot of our kind of protocol and product development in, in public. Um, and so for kind of key protocol decisions, um, we'll be using our forum, which is at discourse.aztec.network. Um, we will obviously be tweeting out about that uh, via our Twitter account, which is uh, Aztec Network. Uh, but really we're, we're trying to build Aztec in public and get as much community involvement in in the design and building of that as possible. Um, so we, we will have lots of RFPs um, coming up where we encourage people to kind of chime in uh, on the design decisions we're making, everything from sequencer selection through to kind of account abstraction and, and token models. So if you have thoughts on, on, on how that should work and want to kind of uh, debate some of our ideas, then yeah, please, please head to the forum. Super cool. Thank you guys for coming on again. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Yes, thank thank you. This has been a lot of fun.